In front of me here for our uh, telephone audience is a map of part of Africa and also Western Asia. And uh, Milwaukee, of course, is a few thousand miles west of that. But Africa came to Milwaukee. Workers of African consent, descent produced so much of the wealth for Milwaukee capitalists. And they were followed by tens of thousands of Latino workers. And we want to talk about the road leading to the Milwaukee rebellion against racism. It struck first two years ago in Ferguson, Missouri. And then it went to Baltimore. And now it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I remember December 1974. There were maybe 120,000 African Americans in Milwaukee. But the cops, Milwaukee cops, managed to kill four black people in one month. If cops were killing African Americans at the same rate in New York City, the annual rate would be more than 800. 16-year-old Jerry Brookshire was shot in the back on Christmas Eve. That season's greetings from the Milwaukee Police Department. The cops came, the cop Marlowe claimed that his uh, gun fired accidentally because Jerry Brookshire was resisting arrest. Ola Mae Davis had enough courage to tell the truth, and for that, she was convicted of perjury by the DA, E. Michael McCann. Three other black people were murdered the same month by racist Milwaukee cops. Johnny Pendleton and Mary Starks were killed in what was called Bronzeville, the original black community of the 1920s. It was just west of the big Schlitz brewery that refused to hire any of them, now largely demolished. The cops claimed they were looking for a suspect they never found, so they just invaded Johnny Stark's house when he tried to defend himself they just shot him away. There is no right, no Second Amendment rights to self-defense for oppressed people in the United States. Mary Pendleton died of smoke inhalation after cops fired tear gas canisters starting a fire. They notified the fire department that they're going to do that. They never notified the inhabitants of the apartment house. A few years before, Milwaukee cops said, the Freedom House, belonging to the NAACP Youth Council, whose advisor was, of course, the legendary Reverend Jim Groppy, who I can say was a friend of mine. They set it on fire, too. Many years later, in the 90s, the police even protected the, the cannibal, Jeffrey Daimler. They turned over a Loatian youth, 14-year-old Loatian youth, over to him, who was killed that night. I don't want to go into the details. What happened to these two cops? Well. Police department was forced to fire them. They were reinstated by a judge who used to be president of the Green Bay Packers. And one of the cops later was elected president of the so-called Milwaukee Police Association, their PBA. It's been pointed out that Milwaukee is the most segregated area, Milwaukee County's area in the United States. It's maybe even worse in Chicago, where the late Mayor Daley moved the 16-lane Dan Ryan Expressway further west so there would be a wall between the black south side and the almost totally white at the time, white southwest side, where Dr. King went, marched, and he was, he was met with bricks. Milwaukee's black community is on the north side of town. It's got streets like Tetonia and Bremen, used to be, you know, a German neighborhood. Up to 45 or so, 12th Street was the western boundary. All the landlords got together, a tiny little black community, keep it in, hemmed in. But even in the 1960s, the boundary line was 27th Street. You could, there were only a few hundred black people west of 27th Street because of you know, racism in, in housing. What makes Milwaukee different than almost every other northern city was that it was the last big manufacturing center that the great migration of African Americans came to. Even in 1950, only 27,000 African Americans were in the city. Now it's 240,000. And it just made this process that much more dramatic. As late as 1980, maybe half of black workers had factory jobs, which in Milwaukee al almost always meant being in a union with union wages and union benefits. Half of the black workers owned their own home. It was much like Detroit, which made the, de the continuing decades-long depression that much more of an attack on black people. De as I said, deindustrialization hit Milwaukee as hard as anywhere else. Before between 1978 and 1982, the median income of black families in the Midwest fell by 36%. That's what high-tech, low-pay 
meant for black workers. It was not liberation. Capitalists wanted to get away from black workers, the most militant and union conscious workers, along with Latino workers. Between 1977 and 1992, that is before NAFTA, 55,000 factory jobs were destroyed in multinational Milwaukee County, where now one out of four people, including the suburbs in Milwaukee County, are black. And there are tens of thousands of the Latino community and some Asian workers as well. But 66,000 manufacturing jobs were created in the west of Wisconsin, which with a few exceptions is overwhelmingly white. Particularly sad was closing the A.O. Smith Auto Frame Plant in the middle of the black community. This plant produced over the years 150 million auto frames and 50 million truck frames. These were the frames that you built a car on. Now they use unit body construction. It's all destroyed, 360 acres. We used to sell Workers' Worlds there on alternate Friday nights when our paper was a bi-weekly. We used to sell up to 80 Workers' World newspapers on Friday nights when we had headlines about Ho Chi Minh and Dr. Huey P. Newton. Because so many of the workers are black and there were some white workers that wanted that paper too. Even the Wall Street Journal admitted that black workers aren't being hired in their numbers, proportion numbers, in the new insurance, banking, finance, so-called white collar jobs in Milwaukee. That's why I have this fantastic unemployment rate among black workers. Symbolic of the developments in Milwaukee was a worker I knew. His name was Reuben Hale. He wore two hats. He worked at Laddish in Milwaukee, in Cudahy, which was at the time almost all white. But the composition in the factories was different. It's a suburb of Milwaukee, south of Milwaukee. And Laddish was the world's largest forging plant. Steel forgings, 5,000 workers there. Reuben Haley wore two hats. One was that he was secretary of the machinist lodge there, a union, a good union person. At the same time, he was captain of the Fruit of Islam at Mosque Number 3. <coughs> the nation was in Milwaukee before it came to New York because it was so close to Chicago. Reuben Hale, like Malcolm X, later left the nation and he joined our party. And he attended, along with his son, work, the Workers' World Party Conference in 1969. Why did Milwaukee capitalists delay in hiring black workers? Well, first of all, one is the composition of industry in Milwaukee is a little bit different. It's, it's a city that what Karl Marx would call, it produces department one goods. That is means of production. It's the big machine shop town. 50,000 machinists, 10,000 tool, tool and die makers it had at the height of Milwaukee manufacturing history. Even in Michigan, the skilled trades, even when some of the assembly lines in Detroit, like Jefferson Avenue, was 90% black. The skilled trades, tool and die, were like 2, 3, 4% black at Chrysler and GM because of racism. By 1917, a quarter of the 50,000 workers in the Chicago stockyards, probably the biggest concentration of workers in the United States a century ago, were black. Thousands more black workers are employed at U.S. Steel, Southworks, and Inland Steel. And by the way, those black workers in the stockyards were crucial to the organizing drive led by William Z. Foster, a later communist leader who died in Moscow in trying to or organizing a successful strike. But Milwaukee had the sixth largest number of foundries, bosses, but bosses hired a lot of white workers off the farm. Black workers had to change trains in Chicago, particularly if they took the Illinois Central trains going to Central Station on the lakefront. But I think the big reason for Milwaukee capitalists in refusing to hire black workers in large numbers might have been the 1919 Chicago race riot, which started with a white, white racist attacking a black swimmer who drowned. Racists and cops attacked black people, but black workers fought back against racist mobs, and by the end it was an even, almost an even Steven struggle. One of those that instigated the mobs was a member of the Hamburg Athletic Club, so-called Athletic Club, by the name of Richard Daly, the future Chicago mayor. Black workers went back and forth between Chicago and Milwaukee, 85 miles away. Tanneries and the docks and the lakefront, there's a little bit of a lakefront in Milwaukee and the Great Lakes, hired black workers. What, what, what's sort of interesting were two plants right next to each other on First Avenue. They were the biggest Grady foundry and Allen Bradley, which makes electrical controls now owned by Rockwell Automation. Both owners were founders of the John Birch Society in 1958, which in many ways in the Midwest was the reconstitution of the American First Committee of the late 1930s. Grady 
busted a steel workers local and one of his foundries became such a hero to the bourgeoisie that he was elected president of the National Association of Manufacturers. All his foundries were non-union, which was an anomaly in Milwaukee. But Grady hired black workers straight from the South, exploited them mercilessly, and what black workers did was they just were worked there for two years so they could get a letter recommendation and they, they would try to get a union job. Across the street, Allen Bradley's 6,000 workers belonged to a union, not just any union, the United Electrical Workers, UE Local 1111. But Bradley refused to hire any black workers at all, and unfortunately the union leadership, UE union, local UE leadership, was afraid to fight it because they thought they would be thrown out by racists. Today, almost nobody works there. There's so few workers, the local dissolved in 2010. The Bradley family sold Allen Bradley, which is a premier maker, it's like the Cadillac of electrical controls. Milwaukee produced like 40% of these. You'd see them on machines all over the world, you know. Uh, for hundreds of millions to Rockwell Automation, they, set, they poured the money into the Bradley Foundation, which of course is a way to get rid of inheritance taxes. And now this is one of the biggest slush funds for racists, for right-wingers. It paid a million dollars to the author of the bell curve, which is like a manifesto of white supremacy. Uh, so you can just see that even though black workers were kept out of Lynn Bradley, what did white workers finally get out of that? They got unemployment too. Now Milwaukee is known for, a couple, for several things. Uh, when it, uh, it defeated Yankee imperialism in 1957 in the World Series. But it's also known, what, around the world, beer and socialism, you know. And there was a TV series years ago that I never watched and I don't want to see. It's bittersweet to me because not only have almost, there's only one brewery left in Milwaukee, but that there wasn't a single black worker hired in these breweries until 1951, despite the fact that it had a socialist leadership before World War II. And this is the problem of so-called Milwaukee socialism. In many ways, it's like Bernie Sanders socialism. It's not real socialism. It's not revolutionary socialism. You know, in fact, what left-wingers used to call it was sewer socialism. And the reason was when the proud claims of the socialists, we had socialist mayors, three of them. We had a socialist congressperson, Victor Berger, was they built a sewage plant, which is a good thing for sanitation, and they were able to sell what comes from human beings into a fertilizer, milorganite, that's used, it's like the very expensive fertilizer used on golf courses and also for the uh, giant stadium in the Meadowlands. It also has all sorts of heavy metals in it. It's probably given cancer to several former Giants football players. So this is, but these socialists also do good things. They built natatoriums, which were public baths at a time when almost nobody, very few people had showers or bathtubs in their houses. Uh, one of the things they were proudest of was Milwaukee had the lowest fire insurance rates. You know, now of course that's beneficial for business, but you know, who dies in fires? It's poor people, it's workers, and that sort of thing. And above all, they built a tremendous park system. Yeah, in fact, one of the parks is called Whitnall Park. It was named after a socialist who in, was in charge of the county park system. Socialist Congressman Victor Berger, at the time of the Ludlow Massacre, when Rockefeller killed the coal miners in Colorado, he called upon the workers that every worker should purchase a rifle and know how to use it. Berger was later expelled from Congress for opposing World War I. It's interesting, the two Congress people who were expelled during the 20th century, one was uh, the great Adam Clayton Powell and the other was Victor Berger, who happened to be Jewish. He represented a largely German neighborhood. It was many of them, thousands of them, socialists. But Berger also made racist comments. Now, in contrast to that, the, the communists in Milwaukee, they fought racism. One of the biggest plants in Milwaukee was Alice Chalmers. Many years before, in 18, 1886, there was a strike there in a, for the eight-hour day. And the governor sent the militia, the National Guard. They were going from plant to plant. In a section of Milwaukee called Bayview on the south side, they shot down six workers, and a youth were later fired tall. It was called the Bayview Massacre. And it was these events that sparked the mass meeting in Chicago. 
that they use as an excuse to kill, to hang the Haymarket martyrs in 1886. The struggle, the struggle for the eight-hour day also comes from the working class in Milwaukee as well as Chicago. Well, they built a huge plant west of Milwaukee, and the suburb was named after it, West Allis. And uh, uh, by the way, Liberace was born there as well. And uh, this plant was the biggest single factory in Wisconsin at the time, 11,500 workers. And just to organize it, it took a 76-day-long strike in 1941 where they used armored cars for the first time against strikers. In 1946, they broke that union because they wanted to take communists with a broken strike. The leader was a man by Christoffel. He was actually a member of the Socialist Party, but he was friendly to the CP. He was willing to work with them. And by the way, the basis of the radical workers were Croatian Americans, Croatian immigrants, just like there were thousands of Croatians in the partisan armies. Yes, there were Utashi fascists, but there also were Croatian communists who were the first one killed by the Utashi. Well, this didn't do anything well for Alice Chalmers. It was pushed to the wall, long, slow decline. They built a lot of things, including these huge power plants in Queens that was built by Alice Chalmers. But it went bankrupt in 1985, thousands of jobs gone. The leaders like Joe Ellis of the Communist Party played a major role in the black community. So did Calvin Sherrard, who belonged to a different political tendency, some of whose members joined, formed Workers' Wall Party. So that's some of the background to the struggle in Milwaukee. It's a very racist ruling class, but it's become a multinational city. The city is now 40% black. And it's also been joined by tens of thousands of Latino workers who every May Day come out in their thousands. So we look forward to the struggle in Milwaukee and around there. We have roots there. We're going to rebuild. We're on the ballot in Wisconsin. And we're going to get thousands of votes for Comrade Monica and Comrade Lamont. Thank you. We also got to talk about the heritage of the Black Panther Party that had a chapter in Milwaukee and later a National Committee to Combat Fascism. And there are three members of the Black Panther Party who were subject to the biggest frame up there called the Milwaukee Three. They were accused of firing a shotgun through the back window of a Volkswagen Beetle at a cop while they were, you know, they were selling, after they came back from selling the Panther at Great Lakes. Just try to picture that, the old Volkswagen Beetle. That's a pretty hard thing to do. We, of course, spent months trying to organize the defense. They were framed up in a way. And so many of the leaflets produced for the Black Panther Party were printed in the basement of comrades Betsy and Al Stergar. On North Sherman Boulevard, about 10 months, about 12 blocks or so north of where the rebellion was. I mentioned Father Grappi. But we should also remember, of course, Lloyd Barbie, the late Lloyd Barbie, a civil rights leader who uh, organized the school boycotts. He organized the memorial meeting along with comrades who formed the Workers' Well Party branch for Malcolm X. And also Vel Phillips, who's still struggling. She's now 92. She was the first city councilwoman elected in Milwaukee. She would introduce open housing laws year after year to be voted down 18 to 1. That's how racist the city is. We also were involved in the defense of Ray Mendoza, a man that he tried to frame up for shooting two cops. We finally got him off. And a leader in the Latin community was Ernesto Chacon, uh, who, along with Jim Grappi, led a march of welfare mothers to, Washington, uh, to Madison, where they took over the Capitol in 69. That didn't just happen in 2011, but also in 1969, they kicked out the legislators, including uh, future Governor Tommy Thompson. And uh, after a bunch of comrades got busted in 1972, Ernesto Chacon went around to some taverns on the south side, big center of the Mexican community, and raised bail money for us. I want, do also want to mention two capitalists. I mean, we want to have equal time here. You know, we, do, we just don't want to talk about workers and the oppressed all the time. We want to talk about these exploiting bosses. And one of them is one of the many workplaces that were shut down with thousands of workers was the great shops of the old Milwaukee Road, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific that extended all the way from Chicago to Seattle. Most of those tracks are torn up. A lot of it was electrified. It was the longest electrified railroad in the world when it opened. They just have torn it up just in time for the coal deposits to open in Wyoming so it would be monopolized by the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Well, anyway, 
head of these shops in the 1880s was a guy called Samuel Bush, who later went into a joint venture with William Rockefeller, a brother, younger brother of John D. Rockefeller, and Samuel Bush begot a fellow by the name of Prescott Bush, who was senator from Connecticut and head of Brooks Brothers Harriman, and also, uh, you know, uh, you know, a banker for the German cartels, who who begot uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, who begot George W. Bush. So uh, these pigs have some roots in Milwaukee. And the other capitalist I want to mention is Alexander Mitchell, who made a fortune out of the Milwaukee Road. In fact, they have a Mitchell Street in Milwaukee, which is a center, uh, which is now largely Latino. Well, uh, he had, I don't know, there was a son, son or grandson called General Billy Mitchell, and he named the airport in Milwaukee after him. And very important in U.S. imperialism was he organized what was going to be the first bombing raid by the U.S. Army Air Force. He assembled, I mean, they didn't even have US, enough U.S. planes. They had de Havilland's and all that. And the target was not Kurdish people, Arab, or even Nicaragua, no. It was striking coal miners, black and white coal miners in Logan County, West Virginia. Thank you.